Train at 38 and the grinder at track section 2451. Powered up, powered out. Let's power down. Okay. Just park it there on the storage lane. Yeah, 76 train is on power 6. From storage lane. Where's it? There's no surprises. It's already. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Good morning, U.S. Good morning, U.S. Western Fire Department. This BC Rapid Transit Control Center calling. Confirm that the power is on and the phones are working. Yeah, I just reported the blue light at uh, Metro. Burnaby Fire Department, good morning. It's BC Rapid Transit Control Center calling. Just to confirm that the power is on and the phones are working. Thanks. Bye bye. Some two and a half thousand years ago, the Greek philosopher Aristotle summed up the reason why cities should exist. The purpose of the city, he said with immutable simplicity, is to make people happy and safe. Time changes cities, but not the purpose of them. The city of Vancouver, here on Canada's Pacific coast, has 100 years of time behind it and a phenomenal record of change from non-existence through the brawling resource-based youth to the brink of the 21st century and the rate of change is accelerating as change accelerates the rate of movement about the city slows down for many people in terms of transportation the purpose of the city to make them happy and safe seems threatened before, the people of Vancouver had opted against a system of interurban superhighways to speed transportation, citing environmental and economic drawbacks. Without realizing it, they had opted, as have others in other cities, for mass rapid transit. Time would reveal it an astonishingly appropriate choice for the city.
On the city's waterfront, close to a sea bus terminal serving populated areas across the harbor, the mouth of an existing railroad tunnel, passing under the downtown core. With tracks tiered one above the other, the tunnel could carry rapid transit. Beyond the tunnel, a rundown industrial area. Then, a broad avenue with a wide median, giving access to an existing right-of-way where long before, long abandoned, North America's first electric transit system served what had now become among the city's densest suburban areas. Along the right-of-way, a large abandoned gravel pit, and ultimately, 21 kilometers from the sea bus downtown, the city of New Westminster. This would be the first phase of Vancouver's rapid transit system. Even as planning began, extensions south into Surrey, east to Coquitlam were determined. Eventually, the system will serve every compass of the city. Some 5,000 kilometers away, a company in central Canada was just perfecting revolutionary transit technology. Linear induction motors, quiet articulated axles, automated computer control. This would be the transit system for Vancouver, its first major installation. Spring 1982. Work begins along the median of Terminal Avenue. Crews relocate underground services in preparation for pile driving. Foundations are laid for the first of hundreds of T-shaped columns which support the transit guideway. Drillers begin to investigate the integrity of rock structures around the tunnel. Machines move in to refashion topography at the disused gravel pit. 800,000 cubic meters of fill are delivered. Summer advances and soon the first of many precast concrete beams begin to converge on Terminal Avenue. The beams are sections of guideway, the longest, heaviest loads ever moved on Vancouver's streets. They take up all available road space and must move late at night. The beams average 100 tons apiece. They are lifted into place, bridging the space between columns. Terminal Avenue will be the first kilometer of the new system to be completed. A pre-build demonstration section, which gives the project team a chance to learn, the public a chance to experience the shape of transit to come. A significant portion of the new technology, particularly the linear induction or LIM motors, is manufactured locally. Jobs are created, but more important, the expertise gained holds promise of future manufacturing, 
as similar systems are built in other cities. In Kingston, an entire factory is busy building the 114 cars the Vancouver system will operate. The pace of progress on Terminal Avenue accelerates. Rails are laid along the guideway, each section welded to the next. The first station, Main Street, nears completion. Because rails are continuous, there will be no characteristic clickety-clack. Trains will be quieter. Because the axles under the cars articulate, they will move through curves without screeching. In March 1983, the first cars from Kingston arrive at Terminal Avenue. The cars are lifted onto the track beside the Main Street station. Summer 1983. Kilometer one of the new system goes into operation. Trains run back and forth from Main Street over a six-month demonstration period, dispatched from a miniature control center. Over 300,000 people experience the ride. As 1983 advances towards winter, construction work moves into high gear along the entire length of the project. Some 1,700 men and women will be directly employed over the months to follow. Thousands more in manufacturing and services associated with the project. On the east side of downtown, two new tunnel portals have been driven into bedrock. The new tunnels will curve and stack inside the rock from side by side to one above the other, intersecting the existing tunnel 250 meters away. Section by section, contract by contract, progress leaps ahead along the entire route. While most of the guideway will be elevated, some sections are at grade and some below it. Earth walls are given a stabilizing coat of concrete. June 1984. Tunnel crews break through to the existing tunnel beneath downtown. A ceremony celebrates the event, one of several marking milestones of achievement along the way. Over the 
over 550 columns to be built, more than a thousand guideway beams to be precast and moved through the night. Month by month, the physical reality of rapid transit to come emerges. Where the guideway curves across Grandview Cut, 28 meters above ground, the weight of concrete precluded its use. Steel beams were called for, enormous spans prefabricated in Victoria and barged to the mainland. November 1984, the final section of guideway, the last beam, is lifted into place in New Westminster. Crowds turn out to watch and share the celebration. Winter gives way to spring, and work proceeds on 13 stations above ground. Less than a year from now, thousands of people will be entering stations, buying tickets from machines, waiting on platforms for trains which can run as close as 90 seconds apart. A whole new way of going to town is in the making. Deep below the downtown core, work on the tunnel becomes intense. The tunnel is being divided to make it two tunnels, one above the other. Before work began, exhaustive testing and surveys were conducted to ensure that buildings above would not be damaged. Every square meter of every building along the tunnel's route was inspected.
two stations are carved from the bedrock beneath the city, Burrard and Granville. In a matter of months now, tens of thousands of people daily will be riding escalators and elevators, going about their lives in the city. In what three years ago was a disused gravel pit, a maintenance and service facility for the system nears completion. The system's nerve center will be located here. The marvelous electronic complex which will command, control, and monitor its every aspect. Section by section, the rails are welded together and locked in place. Soon, they will be complete. Two tracks, 21 kilometers long. Spring gives way to summer, three years since construction began on Terminal Avenue. The hundreds of contracts, thousands of people working, begin to consolidate as a transit system. The pieces are coming together. Under the high-rise core of the city, a vital new artery nears readiness to serve the city's life force, the people who interact within it. Connections are made to complete the system's incredible electronic circuitry. The first pulses of energy begin to flash at the speed of light through the system's fiber optic nerves, connecting and controlling its extremities with the brain of it all in a long forgotten gravel pit. Not one, not two, but three sophisticated computers cross-check and first agree on every order before it is carried out. The people who will operate this remarkable technology begin to comprehend the nature, the character of what has been created. They embark upon the process of commissioning the system, delivering it for public use. People are hard at the work of landscaping along the guideway. The entire length of it will be a park, punctuated by pockets of rest and recreation, linked by walkways, cycling and jogging trails. The system's concern for people can be found on every car and every station. Every car has an intercom instantly connected with the control center. Every station has video monitors. Should anything fall between platforms, an electronic intrusion detector will instantly stop nearby trains.
In January 1986, Vancouver's rapid transit system begins public service. It begins to serve the people whose interactions within the city are the city. It seems as though the city, and the people who are the city, have bloomed to fulfill a new sense of destiny, to greet a beckoning capacity for urban maturity, and share it with the world. The measure of a city must be the freedom of people to move and interact within it. The extent to which the city makes them happy and safe while doing so is the measure of its greatness. For the people of British Columbia's lower mainland, a new era has begun. <laughs>